writing this book took me around four to five years. And you can understand certainly that uh, the translation came years after the publication of the book itself. And that I have moved on already. So I'm discovering the book again through the translation and through conversations with you. So after this book, another book came out uh, about the Civil War, about the Cambodian Civil War. And it's also a lengthy novel, and I hope it will come out in English pretty soon. So therefore, one will have uh, the complete series that I wrote about those issues, I think, are important. Today I met Patrice Nganan at the 2019 Twin Cities Book Festival here in Minnesota, USA. is the author of eight books, including the novel Dog Days, which received a number of prizes, uh, and Mount Pleasant, the first in a magisterial trilogy about Cameroon. In 2017, he was imprisoned in Cameroon following the publication of an article critical of government repression. He teaches comparative literature at Stony Brook University in New York, and he holds a PhD from Johann Wolfgang Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. His most recent book is When the Plums Are Ripe. It's a novel, and uh, they, they will be available for sale uh, after the program, so I encourage you to purchase one and have uh, the author sign it for you. Uh, it just came out in August of this year. It is the second volume in a trilogy after Mount Pleasant. Yeah. And uh, in really? this novel of radiant lyricism, our author recounts the story of Cameron's forced entry into World War II, and in the process, complicates our own understanding of that globe's spanning conflict. Grounding his tale in the story of a poet, the author questions the colonial record and recenters African perspectives at the heart of Cameron's history, all while writing with wit and panache. When the Plums Are Ripe is a brilliantly, has been called a brilliantly crafted, politically charged epic that challenges not only the legacies of colonialism, but the intersections of language, authority, and history itself. signed a lot of books and uh, I bought uh, when the plums are ripe I listened to him make a presentation of the book it was a very interesting uh, presentation when this book was being translated the editor asked me if I wanted to keep this map so you see the map and the map is straightforward but the map is quite politically charged in Cameroon now. So when I published the book in French, it wasn't an issue. So I published it, I think it was in 2014, 15, something like that. So it wasn't an issue. And since 2016, nobody in the Francophone part of Cameroon wants to see this map. And everybody in the Anglophone part of Cameroon wants to see this map. <laughs> because they love this map when they speak English and they hate it when they speak French. <laughs> because this map is the Cameroon that speaks French. It is the Cameroon without the English speaking part of Cameroon. It is the Cameroon of between 1921 or specifically 1919 and uh, 1961. So it is a Cameroon that um, 
had its capital in Yaoundé. I was born in Yaoundé. It is a Cameroon that was part of the French-speaking part of Africa. So it is a Cameroon that went through World War II. So it is not the Cameroon that went through World War I, because the Cameroon that went through World War I is different in its shape. So if you take, if you have my first book, it is also 500 pages, etc., you will have a different map of Cameroon. So if you have a third book, you will have a third map of Cameroon that's different. So you have three maps of the same space. I loved what the book is about, and uh, he gave a lot of history. I, I bought this book because of the the history uh, of what makes La Republique Cameroon what it is today. Um, very interesting read. He may, he uh, one of the things he said is that he speaks German, French, and English, so he he had access to all the background material in all the languages. You know, La Republique Cameroon was colonized by uh, by the by the Germans uh, and the French. So what the Germans, the French and also if you want to include Ambazonia in that and also the English. So he said he had a, he speaks both languages fluently and so he has a lot of uh, historical information on this book. So I decided to buy it. He also had another book there called uh, Mount Pleasant. I also bought that one. This one is a paperback. I, I love the hard copy. The hard copy, I think that's the original. So um, I, I'm looking forward to a very interesting read. Um, Patrice made a presentation, which I, I will bring you that presentation uh, in another video. What's up? So, in essence, Cameroon is in a civil war. So, in general, people say there are only a few wars, at least from an American point of view, there are only a few wars that make sense. The civil war make, made sense because one had to end slavery. Yes, that makes sense, something like that. And I think many people say World War II, Nazism had to end, but fighting for languages? You know, one would say, come on, folks, I mean, really, <laughs> look for something else. <laughs> Slavery, you know, so even invented. Nazis, you know, come on. You fight for languages? And you fight for European languages? <laughs> you know, I mean, it is funny, right? Like, come on. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Well, one can say wars are stupid, but your war is the most stupid war one has ever seen. <laughs> the quick question I have for you is, you know, I heard you say in there that the, the struggle in Cameroon is a struggle between languages. I, I, is, are you, were you trying to be quick there or are you really serious that there, that's a struggle between languages? Because I think there's more than that. Oh, uh, it is important to always remember to whom one is talking. If you talk to somebody from Bamenda, the person has the details of lived experience of daily battles. If you talk to somebody who is in France, the person doesn't know anything about what's going on in the country where people speak French and English. If you, speak, if you talk to Americans, they will not even know where Cameroon is. So that distinction is essential, otherwise you will simply waste your time and waste people's time. And you will lose the few people who may be, may be interested in what is happening. What I say is that the, that history is larger than what we are. And it is essential to look at it from the historical point of view. I could have argued from the structural point of view, from the point of view of self-determination, etc., etc., but today, I simply felt, looking at my public, given that we are here in the Midwest, I suspect many people did not hear about Cameroon before, don't even know where it is on the map. I felt like, okay, if I start with language, 
they will have a quick understanding of a hotspot. And I think that you clarified a little bit of a little bit of it when you went a little deeper into the into the story, and then you talked about the two maps and the. First of all, I like the fact that you maintain that map. <laughs> of course, you understand that being an Anglophone, right? Yes. Or an Amazonian. Yeah, I understand. For instance, I didn't mention the word Amazonia. Not yes. that I chose not to. In general, I do mention. But the important is, remember, I came here to present my book. <laughs> so so the, selfish, the selfish intention is to have people be interested in reading this book. And when they, when they are interested in reading it, it is not healthy to sidetrack. Uh, the story of the book itself to talk about something else but now if i can put the book in a context that's larger which is to make them understand that the book is actually current then that one has both yeah and, and i did not mean to indict you for that i just meant I, i'm doing this part now for our own local audience i think i think you looked at your audience and you knew what would be uh, would be uh, expedient for, yes. for the situation so that was good i love the i like the background you gave Mm -hmm. um, and I like the history you interjected. Mm -hmm. um, and I know. Let me ask you this: Where do you see? Where do you see us ending up? <laughs> I, I know that's a very big question, but I, I want it, I, I want. I want you to speculate a little bit. Yeah, the first thing is that nobody, none of us, knows where the future is going to uh, head, and uh, we are part of a life we don't control. Uh, what the best we can do is to live a fulfilled life, to have a clear conscience and to know that in front of our own children, we are not going to be ashamed. And that when our children will ask some questions, for instance, why are people dying in Cameroon? We are not going to be ashamed. In my particular case, if my daughter asked, why is it that, that you haven't brought me to Cameroon for so long or never brought to Cameroon? I need to have an answer to that question. And I need to know that my answer makes sense. None of us wants people to lose their life in Cameroon. None of us. Because we are one. Each of us has one life. We come from communities that are intertwined. Nobody will ever imagine taking a country and running away with it. So we are forced to live next or with each other. So the modality of living with each other, that is the question. So the sagacity we have is to make sure that what is happening today never happens again, but also that we find a way through which everybody will be happy to go to Cameroon, show places, know that it is a country that is prospering, and where people are blossoming, and where freedom is actually uh, materialized, and where actually you can bring your own friends from America, and know that you will not be killed in the process, and they will not be killed. All of us dream of such a place. So where we are heading, I think, I hope, is personally is to build a place that I'm going to be part of. To build, I haven't called it a country. Africa is large enough. I'm at home in so many countries in Africa. But I would like to have a place where people at least recognize that it is their home. And that place is not the Cameroon of today. It is certainly not the Cameroon of today. I really, let me tell you something that I really appreciate in your presentation today. The fact that you you give backgrounds, I, you know, I've read quite a lot. I'm curious about the history, but just listening to you, I, I gathered a lot, and uh, and I think that we should continue to do that. So, but uh, can you explain the, the importance of giving the background to the history, or the, the background is, to the events that are happening now? The thing is that on both sides, on the side of Amazonia, on the side of La Republic of uh, Cameroonians. It is important that people do not die for nonsense if they choose to die. There is no reason to die for a country that calls itself a shrimp. So it means there is some work that has to be done. So there is no reason to die for propaganda neither. It means there is something that has to be done. That thing is education. The moment you have somebody educated, the, that moment you know that you have somebody who is not going to die for nonsense. That person is going to actually build a fulfilling life. Fulfilling is what? It is a life where things make sense. The country that calls itself shrimp has no meaning, doesn't know itself, needs to have a content. Now the question is, who puts the content in that country? It is writers, it is it's people with education, it is us, it is people who write books to teach people who they are, where they come from, and therefore they can know where they are going. That is very simple, it's a simple proposition for me. Education is the key, it's the tool. So then people will know what they can stand for, what it means even to have no rights, and what it means to have rights. 
So what are those rights we are fighting for? What is it that you are actually wanting to die for? Those kinds of things are part of education. And uh, you know, for me, writing history, writing stories, actually tapping into history, it is a way of giving a sense to people's lives. Yes, I really appreciate you coming to town. I couldn't miss it for anything. Thank you. I know you wanted to keep it a business trip. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, I've tried my best to make it a business trip. Thank I think uh, your comments, even to the rest of the world, are still important to our people because the message is the same, even though you try to adjust it for the particular audience. And I appreciate you doing that. I think uh, I tried to make it a business trip, as you say. <laughs> I failed. <laughs> I did not know I would fail. I've tried it twice and I failed twice. So it means I won't try it again. No, don't so try again last... because I knew about you coming from a friend of mine. He said, he said, Ghana is going to be in town. He gave me a tour a month ago. Yes. Like he's going to be in town on this day. Yesterday he reminded me, gave me the address, gave me everything. <laughs> so, so I'm glad I'm here. In fact, if he did not remind me, I would have forgotten. Yeah, but the reason is simply that, uh, uh, you know, I felt I'll try it this time. And, you know, I, I did it twice and, and it didn't work. I won't, I won't, I won't do it again. Yeah, well, again. you know, people like the things that you do. Mm. Because I think um, you bring attention. Mm. Like you were saying that things are happening back there, no nobody is reporting them. Mm -hmm. uh, you bring attention to, to some of those issues, even if it's to a small crowd. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did the piece when you were, when you were locked up. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it is because thank your you. students thank made a lot of noise. Yeah, 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 so, you. so, you know, we promoted that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so stop hiding because yeah. we, we like you to continue to, to do the work. <laughs> and, uh, you. and if you don't want us to come, it, you can just say. Ah, I, no. think, I think you'd be more successful <laughs> in saying that this one is a business trip. I will meet you later at dinner here. I, I don't even know that you succeed there either. But, yeah. but. No, I think uh, uh, one is getting used to one's own public persona. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm getting used to my own public persona. Yeah. And it has consequences. It has. One yes. of those consequences certainly is the environment in which I, yeah. I move. Yeah. And uh, literature in general is a safe environment. Yeah. Politics is not a safe environment. So uh, I understand that I cannot have a literary environment pure anymore. Yeah. So it means I'll take consequence to simply make all my appearances political. Yeah. And therefore it will have a similar Wonderful. You know, I'm, I have my partner. He, he told me that I should find out you'll be in town. They will actually schedule a real interview for you because our channel is really big. But I'm mm. surprised you don't know it yet. But, mm. but if you, we will make some time. The business of writing all these things of Facebook and organizing uh, the francophones, which is a very difficult thing to do because francophones have been sleeping all along. And uh, to have them rise up uh, and is really challenging. And it's it takes, a wonderful thing yeah, it too. Takes yeah. so much. yeah, it is a wonderful thing. Yes. And it takes so much time. So that's, that's why I, <laughs> I took this last year to move a little bit towards Francophones yeah. to be able to uh, work in them. Otherwise, I would have been... Uh, and trust me, it is, it is helping. The, 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 it is expanding the knowledge base. Yeah, yeah, and it sure. is helping and it's bringing people. And like I told you, my brother here came to me and told me he understands where I was coming from before. Yes, but that's yes. through your work too. So no, I want you. to thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for what you do and did. It was nice visiting with him. A very eloquent speaker. Meeting him for the first time. I think we have uh, maybe two more minutes. So time for at least one more question. Anyone else? Good question? Please. Uh, I just want to make sure I understand the political situation in Cameroon correctly. So from what you've been saying, the idea is that essentially the French Cameroonian government is the one that's been kind of the old guard. They've been around the longest. And uh, the, the, the Anglo part of it is the ones that are saying, no, we're like the true independent Cameroon, and we're trying to get the facts straight. And then the French government is the one that's, that's oppressing currently. I have mentioned age. I haven't mentioned each. I've mentioned two different structures that are going at, it, at each other. Um, obviously, you have a president who is old. Obviously, you have a guard that's old. But the issue is not age. The issue is two structures that run themselves independently uh, that are used to being free from each other and where one has preceded the other. So that's what is happening. All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.